Hi everybody and welcome to the Trek Culture Podcast coming to you week by week. I am Sean. I'm Paul. And joining us this week is the very lovely Max Schlinger who is joining our family. How are you getting on, Max? I'm doing well. How about you guys? Good. Yeah, not bad at all. Glad not to bad hear at it. all. Uh, we have a we have a message as well that I would like to play from uh, the lovely Marcus Bronzy, who joined us last week, who unfortunately cannot be with us this week, but he has sent this on for us to listen to. Wow. 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 Not only was it an episode that I liked for various reasons that we won't get into, but how accurate were you and Paul with some of your predictions, hey? What? Guardian and Forever? Well, I think you hit that nail on the head pretty much because you knew it was going to happen. But man, the level of accuracy was amazing. Also, I'm going to take some credit as well. Burn them dying? Hey, we should write for Star Trek. Anyway, look, I hope you enjoy the rest of your show. Hope you have a great Christmas. And uh, that goes out to you, the listener, as well. If you even play this clip. If you don't, I've just wasted 50 seconds of my time. Ciao. (laughs) <laughs> so uh that, that that was for marcus and yes it's merry christmas to everyone so uh he wanted to make because we have to talk about the fact of you know we kind of got a few reveals correct but first of all max who are you well i'm one of those guys that grew up reading those old james blish novellas you know they had the omnibus of all the original star trek episodes and i must have read those things no joke hundred times cover to cover And then by the time I was old enough to start watching television on my own, because I came from one of those families, all I ever wanted to watch was Star Trek. And so every single chance I got, I was sitting down and I would start lecturing anybody in earshot. Oh, this is the episode where this happens. That's the episode where that happens. And then when streaming services came up, well, I had to go through and watch it all again. So I'm one of those folks that has seen entirely too much Trek entirely too many times, and I'm still not sick of it. <laughs> I think uh, our listeners now know more about you than they, <laughs> they do about us personally. Uh, what did you think of Terra Firma Part 2? Well, I had mixed feelings about it, truth be told. Because on the one hand, I really liked... You know, just some of the uh, the character development that we saw really coming to a head. So for one thing, Giorgio shone. I mean, there, there's no other way to put it. But at the same time, I almost felt like, and maybe we can blame the Guardian for some of this, but a lot of it was a little bit forced, a little bit shoehorned, a little bit railroaded. I think that that's a symptom uh, of uh, that's uh, that's how you could describe a lot of the emotional uh, stories in Discovery. Uh, I know that like I'm pretty hard on the show uh, compared to Sean, but uh, <laughs> Sean, <laughs> I I um you know, like a lot of the time. Yes, I might be a little bit more forgiving. A lot of the time, I'm totally totally on the same page as you i i did enjoy terraforma part two i preferred part one i must say i think it had a better opener than it did uh resolution um i thoroughly enjoyed the guardian reveal that scene i thought was just fantastic i thought it was a great shot um i think the age that we live in um it was sort we sort of knew it was coming uh to do with the star dispatch paper and you know, there was a few clues there last week. Now, potentially, I I may blag myself as being much more knowledgeable about Trek than I am. I probably wouldn't have got the Star Dispatch on my own last week. So thank you very much, Internet, for that one. Um, yeah, but no, I, I, I enjoyed it. I did think it sort of belabored the whole, you know, farewell for Giorgio. Uh, I, uh, I gave the memorial scene a down. Um, I thought it was a bit too saccharine. Yeah, the episode kind of ended when Giorgio stepped through the portal and then there was 15 minutes mm. left of the, <laughs> of the show. Max, did you pick up on the Guardian stuff? Is that where you were, you were thinking I, that would go? Or did you think it was going to be like a twist? So as much as I would like to say, oh yeah, I saw that coming, um, one of my fatal flaws is that I'm very much in the Q camp and I'm always looking for Q to come back. (laughs) And so, you know, you've got Carl who he's got a sense of humor. He's kind of witty. He's one of these guys that, you know, he's, he comes across as being a little bit mischievous. And 
that says Q to me. So that's the way I was leaning. Yeah, and also the way they kind of, uh, the way he was dressed and the reclining reading a newspaper felt very Q continuum from Death Wish. Uh, so it's totally understandable. Um, I was disappointed, not, I mean, obviously I, I, I was expecting him to, uh, to reveal himself to be the Guardian or a Guardian. I, didn't expe- I actually wasn't expecting him to be the actual Guardian, which I did like. Um, and he did, I appreciated that he explained his backstory a little bit. What I'm concerned about, though, is that that's it for, for the Guardian. That we spent two episodes speculating about who this guy was, and he's never going to show up again, and it doesn't really matter. I think that is... Yeah, I get that I get that feeling. Um, you know, is it maybe, was he included because, hey, wouldn't this be cool, as opposed to, hey... This feels like a natural and solid part of this story. Yeah, it kind of felt like an I Am Khan moment from Into Darkness. I am the Guardian of Forever. Well, that means nothing to either Giorgio or Michael, and very little to most of Discovery's audience. So that's the big reveal, you know? Um, I, I, I thought the episode, because they set up the mystery of who Carl was, owed a bigger payoff to the audience than what we got. And it was very sweet to see Giorgio walk off into this unknown past but we also kind of know where she's headed that's actually so that, that that's a good um segue into our topic of you know is Giorgio now gone to section 31 well yes she has but when so there is obviously there is the easy assumption of that she has gone to meet up with Tyler. She's gone back to the twenty third century, and she'll more or less pick up from where they left off. Okay, um, there's no reason for that to happen. I mean, it's time machine. She go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, do you have a? I don't want to do like the prediction game. <laughs> you know, like we got a couple of we got a couple of things right, and that's great. But in the long run, it doesn't really mean anything. So I guess I'll ask both of you. Rather than where do you think she's headed, where do you want to see her go? Well, Max, you go. You you were, you go first. I, I have some people. strong feelings on this. My thinking is actually that Section Thirty One needs Giorgio, and I know that's kind of a hot take for exactly the wrong reasons. But here's why: when we have previously seen Section Thirty One in any other incarnation, it's been a myth. It's been one of these things where people say, oh, no, it doesn't actually exist. It's the boogeyman that's taught to Starfleet cadets, you know. And when we see Section 31 in Discovery, it's much more an open secret. I mean, frickin' everybody knows about them. They've got huge fleets that just go everywhere as soon as control starts taking over. You know, this is not something that you hide very easily. Now, who better to take this marauding black ops armada and turn it into the kind of subtle manipulative behind the scenes force that we've come to know and love than Giorgio, who has just had her come to whatever the guy at the center of the galaxy's name was moment and said, oh, there are different ways to do this besides having that iron fist. Sean? Yeah, like I, I don't disagree with a single word of that. Um, I think, I suppose, where I would like to see her, it, it, for kind of the same reasoning, I would like to see a post Picard, section thirty one, um, and my reasoning for that being where the Federation is now, is or I say now as in the end of Picard, it's. It's become much more bureaucratic and it's also become relatively easy to infiltrate. I mean, how far did the Jacques Vash get into? I mean, the head of Starfleet security was, you know, a Romulan Tal Shiar Jacques Vash agent. So it seems that now more than ever, they need a Section 31. Um, I had a theory earlier that potentially Section 31 might be one of the reasons that kind of starts pushing the Romulans and Vulcans back together again to distract the Romulans, to give them something else to focus on. So I'll have, uh, I'll be no fun again and say that along with the mirror, (laughs) uh, along with what I said last week about the mirror universe being um, not my favorite element of the Star Trek canon, um, I don't love Section 31. 
And uh, I just think it's a little... Anytime Star Trek tries to be edgy or darker, to me it comes off pretty disingenuous. And uh, I just... Uh, I don't think that Section 31 is as interesting um, as, like, a focal point as it is, like, uh, like, a foil to come in to play against, you know, our traditional Starfleet, Star Trek-type heroes. So mm -hmm. a Section 31 show to me seems like a bit of a stretch. Now I'm gonna keep an open mind about it because I'd, I'm not one of these people who thinks that Star Trek is one thing and should only be that thing. Uh, I just It's just not the most interesting thing to me, despite the fact that I think that Section 31 was made slightly more interesting and slightly more nuanced in Discovery's second season. I'm just like not quite sure that, that that's a topic that I'm like super interested in, but Giorgio show about Section 31 has to have Ash Tyler. There's just no question. Like, you can't just lead Shazab the Teeth out of this premise. So she's going back to the 23rd century. Or at least that's what I would like to see. I suspect you're right. I, I, I think that's what we're going to see. I think we're going to see herself and Ash running a pared-down version of Section 31. Because my... I suppose not that we have an awful lot of experience or, or different examples, sorry, is that my favourite Section 31 is Sloan. Oh, yes. <laughs> I like that, you know, he's just one man, he's a ghost in the machine. And Max, as you said as well, you know, a ghost in the machine does not have a fleet of 40 starships. I mean, but that was like well, an interesting evolution you know, for the, the organisation, though, right? To go from this open secret... Well, you know, uh, well uh, armed, well equipped, uh, b like legitimate branch of Starfleet to something way more covert that you know has been essentially disavowed. Well, since we're bringing up Sloane, there is something else that was rather analogous to him that we should also bring up because if you look at the Obsidian Order, you know, we can say they had this big fleet and yet they still managed to come back and be this kind mm -hmm. of subtle force and i mean garrick was a fan favorite just because of all of his you know my good doctor they're all true about his many lies and i wonder if we could see something similar coming out of section 31 now because again we know they've got the military strength and we know that they've also got uh, let's call it the experience with dealing with a bloodbath we'll put it that way that says Obsidian Order all over it to me, and we saw that they could ride that line very well. Now, obviously, they're not going to encounter the Obsidian Order for some time in either time, but I wonder if they could, from a writing perspective, take a page out of that book, and that's what we could wind up seeing with Giorgio. So uh, to go back a little bit to Terra Prime Part 2 uh, and the uh, Mirror Universe side of things, how did either one of you feel about the uh, Christmas Carol slash uh, It's a Wonderful Life uh, type storyline, <laughs> which Giorgio attempts to, you know, reform the mirror universe and fails, and Carl pats her on the back for trying? Well, I'll tell you, my... Every time a bell rings... <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Max... <laughs> We both knew you were going there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I came ready to play, you know? Uh, nice, nice way of getting that team in there, Paul. Uh. <laughs> but no, Max, well, what were you my saying? My thinking though? was that uh, we were going to see, like, oh, you can always try again, and a hint, hint like that, with sort of a keep what you've learned in mind kind of a thing. My, uh, I was surprised, I'll put it that way, when... Giorgio didn't seem to have learned quite as much as she claimed to have when she got there. Because if you watch her actions all throughout, yes, she's wonderful to mirror Saru. She says, oh, you know, your, your maturity isn't a fable, as he calls it. You actually can come through the other side. And he does. Lucky for Giorgio. But I feel like she spent so much time playing mental chess with the viewer, not to get too meta, that we didn't get to see quite as much of the growth that she then revealed in talking with the Guardian.
Because at the end there, when she's talking with Carl, she says, oh, here's all the reasons why I wasn't redeemed. And he's the one saying to her, yes, you were, pointing it out. Which, yeah, that's great and all, and that shows growth in and of itself. But for someone like George jo, it almost feels like she should have gone further with it. It feels like she should have been the one to say, this is what I would have done differently, rather than this is what I failed to do. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, I was a bit let down by how <laughs> Giorgio sort of slips back into Empress Giorgio fairly easily, despite her, you know, but despite the changes that she's uh, she's undergone. Uh, you know, she causes Michael to, uh, you know, she's not the one actually doing all the murders, but she's uh, she's inspiring a ton of murders. <laughs> You know, she deals with this, This she's trying to make things better in the mirror universe by continuing to kill. That, to me, was a bit of a disappointment. And then for her to ultimately fail was also disappointing to me. I needed her to actually succeed in what she set out to do so that we could look at the character and it, not just be like, well, at least she tried. Like, that, at least you tried to me, just, just so sad. Points for trying. It, t- it took half of the Discovery crew to get there, but points for trying. Um, I don't know, because I, I wonder, does that kind of fall into... It's like putting on a well-worn pair of shoes. You know, it's straight away you slip back into the way things were. Her growth that... I agree with you, Max, that we're more told about than we see, is that you can see initially she's uncomfortable or, or maybe disorientated in you know the Mirror Universe and... You know, Captain Killy, Mary Wiseman just smashing it. Um, and, you know, uh, Sonico Martin Green chewing every piece of scenery that isn't bolted to the floor, as well as Mirror Burnham. I have to say, I enjoyed Mirror Burnham. Um, she really she really played it for the back seats. Um, but you never once got a sense of a relationship between the two of them. And you kind of got like, oh, you know. Giorgio is going to be good, it's going to be good, it's going to be good. Ah, just kill those ten people. So, Paul, I do agree with you. I think, like, no, no, like... She is still effectively a dictator. She is responsible for however many numbers of deaths. And, okay, she's been a good girl for a while now, and that's good. I'm still dead against the toast at the end of the episode, but, hey, how and ever. You know? Yeah, um, I... You know, you said that everybody, you know, that uh, Sinequa was playing to the back seats. Everybody was playing to the back seats in this episode. If you cut out the yeah, glowering, the episode would have been like fifteen minutes long. But <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Again, to go back to my dissatisfaction with the mirror universe, it's so disposable. So why couldn't the writers be a little bit more bold this week and had Giorgio actual like actually make some changes? make you know like uh, the, the the mirror universe is just inconsequential anything can happen there it, and they often play that up oh anything can happen here you know you just don't know expect the unexpected i i just wanted to see more from from that storyline do, do you know what i think um the the idea of going back and changing i sorry i love the description of the it's a wonderful life um, version, the Christmas Carol version of uh, George O. I love that. I am definitely using that in an article in the future. But um, I love a lot of how Star Trek does time travel because this is a time, even though it's a Mirror Universe episode, it is still a time travel episode as well. Even though it brings us back to quote unquote normal discovery time. Because oh, hopefully they don't do a reset button because yes, the normal time is now 30 seconds. I've lost my train of thought. Time travel in general, right? One of the reasons I loved seeing the Guardian back was this discussion of, yeah, may, is this a way for Discovery to get home? Um, the episode got a bit of flack of, why didn't Burnham just ask Carl about the burn? Yes, I know, I can hear people groaning, going, oh, Sean's giving out about the burn again. Just tell us what it is! But anyway, um, I'm dying to see more about the Temporal Wars. Yeah, that seemed like a, well, you know, we like have to a, go like a plant to me, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If uh, if we go back to, uh, and I, I realize I'm going to be stepping on someone's toes or raising some hackles here, but if we go back to Enterprise with uh, some of the stuff about the Temporal Wars, we can see some of what really took place there and how that would wind up affecting the past in that regard. And so 
it seems to me that the Temporal Wars could in fact be much more the Temporal Wars than we're thinking about, where past meets future all over the place. Because we had one throwaway line in this episode, and I think that it hinted at the fact that time itself can be used as a weapon. And I wonder how exactly that would play out with what we consider space-time. And uh, not to get too speculative here, but we know that uh, going at the wrong warp speed causes significant subspace damage. What if using a temporal weapon, literally a weapon which shoots time, causes things to burn? <laughs> you know, I would be very pleased if they were able to wrap the Guardian's existence and the couple of lines that he threw in there about the temporal war into the burn and, you know, made that a little bit more of a cohesive story. And Ty, yeah, I, I agree. Tied together because, like, Paul, as you were saying, it gives the Guardian more of a reason to be in the show. I loved seeing him. It was fantastic and it was cool and it was a nice callback and they used the original audio. That was great. But it would actually tie it more into the ongoing plot. Uh, and of course, you know, thanks to the Sphere data, Discovery has access to all of these different pieces of information about time travel. Uh, now, Max, I am very much leading in a certain direction here uh, because I'm sure you know all about a, ser a very specific <laughs> ver way of doing time travel that floats through the galaxy every how many 39. years? 39.1, I believe. We are, we are, um, and what is that thing that I am massively alluding to here? We are talking, here? of course, about the energy ribbon, the Nexus. And this is something which was introduced in Star Trek Generations and then never seen or referenced again. And it seems as though it's kind of a wasted opportunity to not bring that back in a really big way. So for folks who may not remember, the Nexus was one of these things that nobody ever was really able to define. All they knew was that, oh, if you got close to it, you got this taste of this paradise happening somewhere in this alternate reality where time had no meaning. That was the big line, which Soren used and Guinan used. <clears throat> Excuse me. Time had no meaning whatsoever, and yet at the same time, you could exit the Nexus, and you could leave anywhere, anytime you wanted. So you could literally use it as a transportation system, and I have a video coming out a little later which goes into this a lot more, but what if the Nexus is itself a transportation system, and what if Discovery can make use of that somehow? Or what if it is used against them somehow? There are any number of opportunities for this phenomenon, this energy ribbon, to come back into play and to completely reshape, in a very literal way, the course of the galaxy. Yeah, I mean, Carl, uh, you know, he, he discussed the fact that at some point in the Temporal War, he had been weaponized and caused some kind of damage to the various timelines. Uh, it would be very interesting if it wasn't just the Guardian that was, you know, that was weaponized in the Temporal War, that it was like, you know, Star Trek has introduced any number of temporal, you know, anomalies and, you know, methods for traveling backwards or forwards in time. So, you know, somebody wrangling the Nexus to do their bidding would be a pretty interesting, you know. I have a, a proposal for who might be able to do that, though. Because something else that we haven't touched on, which I'm sure that some people would rather forget this, but we have future Janway, who could maybe show up and do a thing or two. Because we only ever well, saw her once. Are we talking about, like, an Avengers-style, like, Infinity War, <laughs> where we get, you know, Admiral Picard, an animated Riker, or, you know, like, just everybody oh, come listen, together. I'm here for that, and I, w I want it... That would be amazing if you got an episode, let's call it an episode of Discovery, but you've got the animated Titan, right? And it's drawn in animated style, sitting alongside the very, you know, CGI rendered Discovery. I would absolutely love to see that together. Um, and, of course, our, our editor, Chris, had a, had a great idea of, like, what if we've totally got the Section 31 thing wrong? What if she's actually going to go and join Star Trek Prodigy, and it's going to be herself and Janeway running Section 31, which I think would just be a hoot as well. I think Giorgio and Janeway would have an interesting dynamic. Oh, man, we're already... Oh, we're, certainly. We've gotten right back to predictions, but... 
<laughs> well, how do you feel then? Let's let's wrap up there for this week on our predictions before we get too deep down the rabbit hole. And instead, why don't we have a look at the news that has come out this week? For over two centuries, you're listening to the Federation News Network. Uh, so, uh, Sean, uh, is there any news that you want to discuss this week? Uh, yes, two bits. We will we'll get into uh, what has been released for the upcoming episode of Discovery, uh, which is coming out on Christmas Eve. Um, short sidebar, can anybody actually believe that it's the week of Christmas? I mean, you certainly can, looking at your hat. Oh, it's just my standard hat. Like I don't know any <laughs> Yeah, I know that um, Discovery uh, Season 3 was actually supposed to air over the summer. So they clearly weren't planning for the uh, Terra Prime or uh, Terraforma two-parter to, uh, to be uh, Christmas episodes. But, I mean, they were snowy and, you know, they had this definite, like, it's a wonderful life thread to them slash tapestry from TNG. But it was good timing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was. It, it was like I'm. I'm. It hasn't been uh, released yet. The, the things that have been released, we have a, a bunch of images have come out which don't really give anything away. Except we see Book is bringing Grudge to uh, the Doctor, whose name has escaped Pollard. me. Doctor Pollard. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, oh God, to 2020. Don't you dare kill Grudge. Just don't do it. So this episode um, is called. But what has been released? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so this episode is called. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this episode is called Sue Call or Cal, uh, which seems like it was renamed uh, from the Citadel, which is at least what had mm. previously been leaked. Yeah. So, um, like, I wonder is this. Is it maybe Sukal, the Citadel, in the language of whoever we're going to meet in this episode? Obviously, do you guys think, from what we've seen so far, like, are we going to meet Kelpians, or are we going to meet somebody else altogether? My thinking is it's got to be somebody else, because it's been telegraphed that, oh, it's going to be Kelpians, it's going to be Kelpians. And it's very obviously, despite what he's saying, having an effect on Saru. You know, he Mm. is preoccupied, even though he claims otherwise. But I think to just have it be Kelpians at this point would be a little too easy. And I think that, you know, Saru's been through a lot. Poor guy. But he hasn't really been through that much disappointment lately. So that would be something that would hit him. You know, this sense of, oh, well, darn, it's still just me. Well, they're also kind of like hitting it home by casting Hannah Spear, I think, who played uh, Serana played his sister mm. last season she was the kelpie and that saru was speaking to last week uh i think that that's clearly like uh, not just that she fits the makeup but that saru speaking to a kelpian who looks a lot like his sister is going to have an emotional impact yeah i i i, I think so um it was funny that they they cast her. I love, I love the description. Just because they had the mask done, um, yeah, it was, listen, lads, it's perfect. But like, we don't know much about Kelpian physiology. Um, you know, are perhaps family lines? You know, kind of share. You know, this shared genetics through time. Maybe they are related. Maybe all Kelpians are related. It'd be a great way of actually having them tie in. But. One thing that was cool from the trailer was, for some reason, Burnham and Culber have to disguise when they get to this, uh, I think it's the Verulian Nebula. We have Burnham as a trill and Culber with Bajoran ridges on his nose. And also some horrific scarring going on as well, just to look cool. Um, so, but obviously we've nothing so far to suggest as to why they need to disguise. And we don't really know much. Okay, good point. And <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. That's my fault, guys. I didn't really lead. There was no question there. It was just kind of I, like the I've, end of the statement. I've got a thought on it. I've, my thinking is that I think this might actually be a bit of meta commentary to an extent, which is also going to be executed very well, because something that we've seen a lot from Trek is that, oh, the Vulcans are all logical. The Romulans are all conniving. The Klingons are all violent. You know, we've got all of these different races who all have these stereotypes associated with them. 
And we've approached this point now that Discovery is in the far-flung future where maybe humans finally have their own stereotype associated with them. And everybody knows that the humans were responsible for the Federation. But now, well, things have changed. Maybe in the same way that we always think, oh, Vulcans are all this way, Klingons are all that way. Everyone th thinks, oh, humans are all that way. And so as a result, we now have a Trill and a Bajoran who are decidedly not human, no, no, no. And so this is necessary for them to be able to approach without having this preconceived notion used against them, which would be very in keeping with a lot of what Discovery has done. Yeah, I think that that's a, that would be a really interesting uh, way to differentiate the 32nd century from past Star Trek eras. Yeah, that is that's actually an excellent point. Um, you know, the humans are now seen as the bad guys of the galaxy, almost. Um, we know something is up. Whether it's revealed in this season or not, something is up with the Federation. Yeah. Something is up with Starfleet. Something's yeah. up with their holographic technology. They keep, uh, every time we see the Admiral <laughs> Van, they keep, like, fritzing out. Like, they haven't fixed that by now? I know. <laughs> I kind of feel bad for it. Um... So yeah, what was released as well is for the last few weeks we've been getting, which has been for the first the, the first sixty seconds or so of the episode has been released, and it seems to pick up directly from where the previous episode left off, which is Giorgio's strange memorial. Um, but uh, now I want to just do a shout out, very much thank you to Jen for spotting this one. Where's Linus? Linus and Giorgio were clearly smashing. Okay. <laughs> Um, we should at least get a moment of, you know, just, wh where is the poor guy? Come on, he's after losing more than any of the rest of them. Yeah, maybe he's at home maybe taking it care was... of their egg. <laughs> oh, sorry. I just have a little... I, I, for some reason, I just had an image there of, you know, a tiny yet fully adult Giorgio being born from an egg on Discovery and it's a way of getting Michelle Yeoh back in miniaturized form but also it's not the same character well I don't know that might be going down the prediction hole I don't know I think that's going to be going down the Jeffries tube is what's going to happen you know there's going to need <laughs> something's going to need fixing oh send you know mini Giorgio <laughs> the ship is definitely going to be missing its insult comic so you know this is true uh, that's true um, although it does have Reno, so oh, yes. uh, she's more kind of dry humor. Um, the clip also revealed that um, we have a kind of a pan through the room and you have, you know, that, that dialogue where you're, you're clearly told, OK, you will be in a crowd shot. Just talk. But it does kind of factor in on Cobra going, I'm really going to miss her. I don't know why. But anyway, <laughs> and then it gets up to Adira and Stamets. And it's quite, it's quite a nice scene. Uh, Adira kind of looking around the room going, oh, they all look like such a family. To which Stamets goes, that's we. You know, you are very much a part of this as well. You know, you have people. And then, big reveal, Grey is standing there and says, you have me as well. So Grey is back. So we're going to hopefully find out why Grey decided to feck off for a couple of weeks. Or not. Any, any theories? I think that they're going to draw it out for the rest of the season. Let's stay on theme. Yeah, as, as, as uninteresting as it is to have no debate, I agree. So, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I think once, it, it, I think, yeah, we're on episode 10 going into episode 11 now. Um, I think we know what it's going to be. We're not going to find it. I think, I think we might find out something substantial about the burn this week. Sean, you said um, that every week. I say that every week because I have not lost hope. I have the Christmas spirit. But, um, yeah, uh, we'll find out that, I don't know, somebody left a cigarette near a line of dilithium and the whole bloody galaxy went up. A line of dilithium? Is that like a line of cocaine? A line of dilithium. This is now a thing. Yeah, that's, so dilithium how, uh, and... Uh, yeah. I was just going to say that futuristic starships actually need to grind up dilithium into a line, and then they've got the uh, the specific it's the the nasal extractor that they use to actually go right across the line. Which all uh, this is getting cut out. By then, the way. 
<laughs> All right, we might rein this in slightly. Um, so what we've seen for this week, it looks good. Look, I'm here for it. Um, I think we're all on the same page. It's just, please give us some, give us some information, something that will kind of pick up the pace a little bit. I, I've read a couple of quite fair uh, critiques of Terra Firma. While the two-parter was overall, it was quite an excellent story. I, I would say it's probably a great hour and a half as opposed to maybe mm. two full episodes. But, and this is the same criticism that came about Nepenthe in Star Trek Picard. It's like, you don't have room to do that going into the final part of your season. We only had in Picard, you had 10 episodes, and episode seven was Nepenthe, where we all kind of sat down and had a sit down, had a little kumbaya, and it was lovely. And it was lovely, don't get me wrong. And then like that, you had episodes... Um, Eight and nine, nine and ten, eight and nine, nine and ten, going once, going twice, eight and nine um, in this season, which means you only have a couple of episodes left to start wrapping things up. And it's like, that was a long wayside. You know? Um, anyway, I digress. That was me just having a rant about the episodes. Um, looks like it'll be good. Hopefully, we'll learn something about it. Now, there was another bit of news that came out this week, which is f- fantastic <laughs> because bloody finally. Uh, Star Trek Lower Decks is coming to Amazon Prime. Uh, We're getting it in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and India were all called out by name, and then other territories as well. So, absolutely delighted. Uh, Did you guys enjoy Lower Decks? You know, it grew on me. I'll say that uh, at first I thought it was kind of a Johnny-come-lately, but man, whoever they've got going over every frame with a fine-tooth comb saying, oh, this needs to be like that, they're spot on and they know more than anybody else on the planet about exactly what will work where and how much of an impact even just a tiny little thing will go. I don't want to give too many things away because there are plenty of people who haven't seen it, but you have to pay attention the whole time and you have to watch things more than once if you want to get the full effect. Yeah, I thought it was as close to a perfect season of television that Star Trek has given us since like TNG maybe, but even then there was like a ton of you know, not so great episodes. Uh, so none of Lower Decks for me uh, could go anywhere near Cargo Bay 101, which is what we're going to do right now. That's a segue. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> hey. Paul, how does Cargo Bay 101 work? Well, uh, based on the last couple episodes, you can take anything, no matter how large or populous or intangible, and put it in the Cargo Bay 101 and excise it from the Star Trek universe. So, Max, you're the guest. I think you've got something for us, right? I, I do. I've been giving this a lot of thought. Now, you folks are both familiar with the Wilhelm scream, right? It's, oh, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, we can play it right now, probably. Ah! Point is, it shows up, it just pulls me out of the moment. It's one of these things that sound designers throw in because they think it'll be neat. Well, Star Trek has its own Wilhelm scream, but it's not an audio cue, it's a visible thing. And it's that damn two-handed whack that everybody does. Oh, We've seen Kirk do it, we've seen Picard do it, we've seen Riker do it, we've seen Spock do it, we've seen virtually everybody do it at some point. And when it happens, it's just to me just like, why are you doing that? What, what are you doing? It's not combat effective, all you're doing is hurting yourself, it looks awkward, and now I'm noticing that you're doing it. So I think if we can just get rid of, I don't even know what it's called, but that whack that people do where it looks like they've just been saying please sir can i have so oh, just kidding i want to get rid of that we're putting that in cargo bay 101 not sure how i feel paul what do you think i don't know man um i don't think i've really picked up on it being overused maybe from here on out i'm gonna like constantly see the whack uh so maybe it should just go out the air like i'm just gonna go ahead and agree because i don't have uh, i don't care <laughs> oh, you see, if you if you lose the double-handed punch, you lose the entire Gorn fight. And I don't know if I'm ready to do that. Are we retroactively I'm... taking things out? Oh, do, oh, so do you mean... Uh, I'm assuming that it's just like, if we're taking out the airlock, it's it's gone from the past as well. Yeah, Max, no, so you know, you know, you... The airlock is another... 
I don't think you lose the, the Gorn fight. Even let Okay. Even if you if you take out that if that was one move at one point and yeah, sure it was Kirk's big kablam on the Gorn. But you have the entire episode and I say that this makes the thing better because you know, they're put on this planet where they have all these resources to use and they have to show some ingenuity. And really the point of the episode is that he spares the Gorn. It isn't Oh, we've whacked it. And in fact, he could do more damage if he didn't whack it. So really, his mercy means more afterward. Because now, he hasn't done his big double-handed punch. He's done something like, you know, stick the Gorn with an obsidian knife or something like that. And now, you know, with, oh, I'm really saving it. Without the double punch, though, he may, you know, have to resort to more lethal means. And, you know, while he may not mm-hmm. have wanted to kill the Gorn, at least he tried not to kill the Gorn. So you're saying that the double punch was, in fact, him pulling a punch? Yes, that's what I'm saying. And also trying then to tie it I back to you, Then I ask you... Well, okay. But I ask you, why then did Spock do the double punch on the control panel when V'ger was scanning the Enterprise? Because if it's ineffective and he chose that, did Spock want V'ger to win? Are you saying that Spock has been working <laughs> against Starfleet? Oh, I just always assumed that the uh, control panel was very shoddily constructed, the way it just kind of fell to pieces when he hit it. Well, first of all, absolutely yes. But I'm also not going to rule out the fact that Spock was openly working with V'ger in that film. I mean, right up until a very certain late point in the film. Like, I... Guys, don't let him on the bridge. Like, he's not here for you. Okay, listen, here's how I feel about the double punch. I will jettison the double punch as long as in my head canon, canon even, I can substitute it with Riker's palm punch in every single occurrence of it. I'm, because that is the best fight move ever. I'm on yeah. board with that 100% of the way. Fine. All right, we're cool. All right, that is cool. Then this is me pushing the button. See you later, double punch. Badu. <laughs> And that sort of brings us up to date. Yeah. You know the great thing about that palm punch in TNG? Is it's always like a palm punch and then somebody falling on soft carpet. Well, I'll tell you, there's a... uh, If you watch my video, which is coming out on Sunday, you'll actually see an instance of the palm punch where someone doesn't fall on soft carpet. Good plug. Keep an eye out for it. I will say yes very nice plug and I absolutely will keep an eye out for that because it's like the nicest way you can beat someone <laughs> unless you miss the pad um, so like obviously we will uh, link videos wherever it needs to be um, Max where can people find you on the internet I am out there on Twitter at at Ramsey's the Pigeon spelled just like it sounds but don't put the D in pigeon we don't want the D Okay. Do I need to take that again? <laughs> no, this is perfect. Okay. <laughs> Leaving that in. Not, not editing a second of that. Great. <laughs> um, Polly, same question. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Paul Sutherland. And that's all I'm saying about it. Cool. Well, that's great. That's that's cool. That's nice and handy. I like that you can find me at Sean Farrington. Of course, you can find all of us at Trek Culture um, on Twitter. Uh, you can find the audio for this on Amazon Music. You can find it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. And hopefully, if you are watching this, uh, you will have subscribed to the YouTube channel. Guys, have an absolutely fantastic Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Have a really, really great one. I hope you both have nice plans in the bonkers year that it is. Sure. Uh, I'll be staying in my bonkers bunker. But we've got Safe. our Christmas meal. <laughs> we've got our Christmas meal all set up, so I'm looking forward to that. We're going to be watching awesome. Star Trek Discovery episode eleven. Sue Call. Well, that's a given. Yeah, of course, of course, absolutely. And uh, yeah, we'll all be back for ups and downs on Friday as well. Apparently, uh, guys, thanks a million. Live long and prosper. Thank you. Thank you.